Hello there. One of my favorite films of all time is without a doubt one of the most majestic films ever made and one that just continues to uninspire with repeated viewings. And while those terms are cliché, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey certainly isn't, with its breathtaking sights and sounds that have shockingly yet to be repeated. So why do I find it so brilliant? Well, let's take a look. Partly inspired by Arthur C. Clarke's short story The Sentinel, Kubrick wanted to make a film that changed the way people viewed science fiction by going a more realistic approach. With the space race in full swing at the time, there was a huge interest in the subject, and as he usually did, Kubrick did plenty of research on space travel. Although the interesting thing is the first segment of 2001 actually doesn't involve outer space, but rather the dawn of man. The main aspect connecting all the chapters is the mysterious monolith, which I think represents the curiosity of mankind. Before it appears, the eight men are doing their usual activities, but the monolith causes a spark in them as they're both frightened and curious about this peculiar new discovery. It also leads to the first evolving of them into humans as an ape displays the first act of violence. Again, this seems unimportant to the rest of the film, but it actually proves essential later on in the story. The next segment actually showcases one of the major reasons 2001 is one of my all-time favorite films, the incredible combination of classical music and stunning visuals. Even though it's been out for almost 45 years, the special effects still hold up incredibly well in this day and age. It's hard to believe that all of this is models and not done through computer-generated effects. While Stanley Kubrick won his only Academy Award for the special effects, Douglas Trumbull deserves the bulk of the credit here for showing a highly believable space station environment as the vessel moves through the scene. The sequence is a definite showcase for why 2001 will probably end up being the most realistic science fiction film even though 2001 has long since gone by and Pan Am shut down two decades ago. Alex North had written an original score for 2001 A Space Odyssey, but Kubrick decided to go in a different direction and use classical music instead, and I think he made the right choice there, as Richard Strauss's Blue Danube fits the images so perfectly. To me, no director has used classical music as well as Stanley Kubrick did to point where hearing pieces like Blue Danube, The Thieving Magpie, and Shostakovich's Jazz Waltz No. 2 immediately brings to mind 2001, A Clockwork Orange, and Eyes Wide Shut, respectively. Plenty of people have called 2001 boring, citing this sequence in particular, and I understand why, but I find this whole voyage strangely relaxing. It's almost like the calm before the storm that is the next chapter. Most of the film takes place on the Discovery 1 for the Jupiter mission, as it looks into the two astronauts and their computer companion though not a companion for much longer, as even though he is essentially a machine, he eventually becomes one of the greatest screen villains of all time. Going back to the Ape Man from the Dawn of Man segment, here we have an unemotional creation that eventually cracks and gains violent thoughts. Modern technology on one's mental state is a recurring theme of Kubrick's, and here he truly explores the subject with its full potential. How is technology, a computer we are programmed to be perfect at all costs? However, like anything programmed, there will be a couple of screws literally loose. Rather than admitting to a mistake, he decides to wipe out those with the only knowledge of his error. Thus, he will remain perfect. What adds to the chilliness is that he is treated like a person. Dave and Frank refer to how as a he rather than an it. It's almost like today where computers are such a part of our everyday lives and we are constantly feeding them information. They are a part of the household and they are used for communication, among other things. Adding to it even further is Douglas Rain's creepy voice work. It's actually hard to find on-screen video of Rain, which helps keep the faceless nature of Hal intact. Hopefully we don't reach a future where Hal becomes an even closer reality. Don't even think about it, IBM. Kubrick and Trumbull went all out for the final segment with the Stargate sequence being truly breathtaking. It still looks amazing now, so it must have been an absolute stunner to the audience back in 1968. Now, I could give a whole interpretation about what the final scene means, but I have to be honest and say I don't entirely get it. I've watched 2001 a good number of times, and the point is lost on me. But you know what? I don't mind. I like that Kubrick and Clark left it ambiguous rather than going to a whole pointless explanation. It gives 2001 that final sense of wonder that just adds to the brilliance of it all. Even though 2001 is hailed now as Stanley Kubrick's masterpiece and the great science fiction classic, when it was first released, people weren't sure what to make of it. Even critics at the time panned it for being slow, unemotional, and perplexing. 
However, as more people saw it, and many times over, it began to grow more and more appreciation. The flower power generation especially took to it, but there were critics like Roger Ebert who championed the film on first release. Like Kubrick's other works, 2001 is definitely one of those you need to see more than once, as more things are noticed and interpreted on multiple viewings. Following the release of 2001, Arthur Clarke continued the story of more books, one of which was eventually adapted into the disappointing sequel, 2010, The Year We Make Contact. It's a worthy effort, but director-writer P.A. Hyams doesn't come close to matching up to Stanley Kubrick's immortal classic, and even on its own, 2010 doesn't quite cut it. The cast does a fine job of Roy Scheider and Helen Mirren especially playing very well off each other, and visually, the film is impressive. Stanley Kubrick destroyed the original sets and blueprints of the first film, and the set designers here perfectly recreated them to a T. The visual effects are also very good, and when the film attempts to be tense, it does work in that regard. Lil Nas 2001 also found a spot, and it's nice to see how back, even if them adding a reason for his becoming insane, was unnecessary. Unfortunately, the main fault sits on the screenplay. While 2001 only talked when necessary, the script here is bogged down by incredibly talky scenes full of exposition. And the way they bring Dave Bowman back and insert him into the story is more confusing than anything Kubrick ever did. Maybe I'm a little biased due to my love for Kubrick's masterpiece, but this just doesn't cut it as a worthy sequel to me. In conclusion, 2001 and Space Odyssey will continue to stand as one of the science fiction classics and a triumph of filmmaking in every regard.